of the members of either one of these pieces of Borneo. And you'll notice these are dragonflies that hang vertically. <coughs> the emeralds, the Julianae, or the cruisers, the Chromium, they're very attractive. <coughs> these sometimes sit in the body of an animal. But if you, if you see one, you're doing much better than I've done. <coughs> now, this is the pattern of the vert. This is the Libellulidae. Libellula is Latin for dragon. Back in French, the word is libellule, that's what dragon They're called skimmers or perchers. And one of the reasons they're called perchers is because they perch. These are the ones that come sit there nicely and let you take their picture. And if you scare them off, they come back to the same spot and let you take their picture again. This is one of the reasons I like them. Uh, they are also the most colorful members of the family. Most of, of, of the dragonfly group in Arizona. Most dragonflies, which seems apart, and the other families are not terribly brightly colored. So, but these guys are really, really colorful. So, it's by far the largest dragonfly family. And I would say that unless we're very lucky, with maybe one exception, every dragonfly you're likely to see in some Jaya tomorrow is going to be one of these guys. The so, if you know this family, you can learn those. Uh, most of the dragonflies in Borneo, I think there are seven, over 70 known species in Borneo compared to 10 or 20, most of the other families. Now let's look at damselflies. Now, damselfly families are a lot more difficult than dragonfly families, and I'll tell you why as we go through. And so I'm not going to put you through a lot of detail. But there are three families that it does help to at least be aware exist. And they're related to each other. This is a group of very beautiful. Dragonflies that usually live on streams. The Caloptridae, these beautiful wings. They're called metal wings, or jewel wings, or sometimes denzels, or sometimes broad winged damselflies. Anyway, there are two main groups in Borneo. This is actually a peninsular Malaysian species with this Borneo one is very similar. This likes to live along rocky streams, Eurobases. This one, the Stalus. Is a dragon, the damselfly you see very commonly in the forest. If you're walking through one of the trails of Kubala, like the waterfall trail, or along the near stream of Borneo Islands, you'll see a bright green or bronzy dragonfly sitting on the top of a leaf or on a stone, its abdomen is sticking up in the air, with the male, very thin abdomen, pointing up gracefully. That's a member of the genus Vestalis, like the Vestalis <coughs> is going to Now, I say as because this is one of those groups that you cannot identify the species without looking at the genitalia under a hand. It's just not possible. The colors vary from individual to individual. They can be bronzy or grainy. It's apparently not possible to tell them what this species is, but they're so beautiful, you can just call them all the stalls you can avoid. Related to that is the jewel family of Chlorocytidae. Oh. I don't. <laughs> the Chlorocyphidae, this is probably the easiest damselfly family to identify because it's the only one in which the abdomen is shorter than the wings are. In all other damselflies, the abdomen sticks out further. So if you see a damselfly like this, and the wings are longer than the abdomen, you know it's a member of the jewel family. And these are the ones that live along streams and have these head-to-head -head combats I was showing you earlier. And that some of them are very, very beautiful. This is the one that I showed you having a fight over the stream near the tongue. Uh, this one, this is these here are two more of another species having a fight head to head. Uh, this little guy was in Lumber Hills last week. They're often quite small, and streams, particularly with rocks sticking up out of the stream, are the best places to find them. And then the other family that you should know that's like this, related to these, is very similar to the jewels, but this one, the abdomen, is longer than the wing. This is the Euphiidae. It's pretty well a Southeast Asian family only. Gossamer wings. And uh, this one is one of the few damselflies that will stick its wings out straight like a dragonfly. Uh, this particular one, which I watched, had its wings folded along the back until the sun came out and a beam of the sun hit it. And as soon as it did that, it snapped the wings open. So probably it's sunbathing, it's a sunbathing posture. But if you see this, you've got to sort of look closely and say, well, that's a very funny looking dragonfly. No, it can fold its wings sometimes. It's actually a damselfly. Now the other damselfly families are very hard to tell apart by just looking at them. And so I'm 
saying don't worry about them too much. And also, another reason not to worry about them too much is that the scientists have just taken all these families apart with genetic studies and put them back together again. They've shifted families from, damsel flies from one family to another, they've invented new families, gotten rid of old ones, merged things together, and it's a complete and total mess. So if you, by the time you finish learning them, they'll probably have changed them all again, so I wouldn't bother. But just to show you, um, you can see, if you look at these three damselflies, you probably can't see much to tell markedly why they're different from each other in, in general look, but they belong to three quite different families, the Platystichidae, Platycnidae, and Synagrionidae. And uh, you just call them all damselflies, you don't worry about it. And these are all fairly small and dainty, and quite often you'll see them, uh, particularly in the forest, they'll perch right on the tip of a leaf. You know how a lot of rainforest plants have these drip tips, these long pointy tips to drain off rainwater. Some damselflies really enjoy sitting on the edge of these things and hanging from them. Good place to look. So, where to find odonates? Well, as I said earlier, they can live anywhere. So you can, I mean, um, I mean, saw one outside the hotel as we were coming in. They're, they're in the city, they're out in the country, they're in the forest. They're everywhere, as long as there's water. Anytime you're walking along a sidewalk and passing one of these drainage ditches, you can have a look and see if there are any in there. But there are some that are very specific to habitat, just like birds. There are open country species, forest species, and there are some specialists. For instance, this little one, Rathismia of Aspina, the mangrove dwarf, is only found in mangroves. This is a female, the male is blue. Um, I, this was photographed actually at the wetlands in Kota Kinabalu. I, I've never seen it here, but I'm sure it's all over the mangrove areas of the coast. Whereas this one, Zagonyx iris, is a uh, dragonfly that only lives along rushing streams where there's a lot of water flowing over rocks and rough water. It's a specialist. They call it a cascader, so it's a cascade or rough water. Now, some of the places you can go to see dragonflies are really the same places you've always gone to watch birds. Chupac is a great place to see a lot of the open country dragonflies that live among the rice paddies. Here are some of the ones that you can see in Chupac. We've already talked about this one, like the gomphid, the flange tail. The, this is one of the uh, damselflies, the blue tail here is laying its eggs on some aquatic plants. This one, very easy, this is also Samajaya, very easy to identify because it's got this bottle-shaped abdomen. Asasoma, that's a female, again the male is bluer. Uh, this is a species that was once thought to live in Africa and Madagascar and all through Southern Asia. They've now broken it up into several different species and the one in Madagascar has now been named Asasoma Attenboroughi after David Attenborough, the famous TV presenter. This one is one you can see near the end of the day Pholomus telaria, the white barred dusk hawk. You can see the male has these white patches in his wings and he comes out when it's quite dark, it's almost dusk, and you can just see these little white marks flying along the stream. Sometimes the rest of the dragonfly is very hard to see. And the female's very pale where she is. Borneo Highlands has a quite different set of dragonflies and damselflies. And you can see them right outside the steps of the law. It's a little little trickling ditch that runs across in front of the lodge. I've found several species right there. Here are some of them. We have this beautiful uh, crimson dropwing, Trithemus aurora. It's the one that stands up in the obelisk position. Several damselflies. Apparently. This is one of these Vestalis ones that are beautiful, but you can't identify them. They sit the tops of leaves. Uh, now, we're still learning about the dragonflies that live up there. And that's why when I say Euphia subcostalis, probably, that's because Dr. Rory Dow told me that they're not sure that this is actually the same species as a very similar insect from eastern Sarawak, and it may get a new name. And this one, I sent him a photo of that and said, okay, what is it? And he said, well, this is an undescribed species. It hasn't even been named yet. And yet, right along the side of the road, there it is at Corneal Islands. So there's lots to discover with these creatures. Kuba and Tam, excellent places with many species, particularly damselflies, and some of them only very recently described. This one, Telosticta serapi. Now you won't find that name at all in the Dragonfly Borneo book I showed you before, because this was originally put in a different genus, and it was lumped with another species, very wide ranging species, but Rory Dow wrote a paper a couple of years ago which found that 
each of the, the populations of these, and almost every little national park around the region was a different species. There's Telostica gadi, Telostica santibong, this one's Serabi, and the only place that they're found is in this one little national park, tiny distributions. This one was, you know, when you go in your park, wow, there's a rushing stream sort of on the opposite side of where the lodge is. This was sitting on a leaf there. It was a distance, not a great shot. But again, this was only described in 2012. So it's not in any of the books yet. The frog pond is a wonderful place to see several species of very beautiful dragonflies. Um, three common ones. This one, Critilla metallica. It's much prettier, I'm afraid, than that picture shows. Its eyes can look gold in some lights. And this, this blue band on its abdomen can look, just glow. And they're, they're always at the frog pond, sitting along a, a stem like that. They have black tips on the edge of the wings. There's another related species that doesn't have the black tips. The one we have has the tips. That's why they call it a dark tipped form of skin. The tree hugger. Here's an example of dragonflies where the males and the females are really different. Look at the male. Blue body, great big black patches on the wings. Here's the female, almost camouflaged. They call it a tree hugger because it sits on the trunks of the trees vertically like that. The males will do it too, but because of their color, it's not very good camouflage when one of these guys sits on the trunk of the tree. It's obvious. Anybody can see it. But the females can be very hard to see. So when you go to the frog pond, you usually see the males. They're having territorial fights all over the pond, males chasing each other around the pond. The females only come down to lay eggs. You'll see them sometimes, but quite often they're not there. And when I went there last time, I found this little teeny dragonfly, the rainforest elf, which isn't even on the official scientific list of the dragonflies that are supposed to be in Cuba. So there's discoveries to be made there. There are a lot of beautiful damselflies in uh, Cuba. I think I identified this one correctly. It's either this or a very similar species. Again, right outside the lodge by the orchid pond. This one you find in par, a beautiful damselfly with this brilliant iridescent blue along the side and these bright metallic green and bronze pastelis. You see these commonly in Cuba. NJC Forest. Now originally when I first planned to give this talk I, a couple of years ago, I said MJC Forest is the best place to see dragonflies in, in Fijian. I would go there in an hour or so, just walk along the roadside beaches and see a dozen different species. And I would have originally, had I done this talk last time I was in Sarawak, I would have said, let's all go there for our field trip. Unfortunately, I went back there a few weeks ago, and I'm afraid this is what I saw. Uh, somebody has dumped piles of garbage and trash into the canals. The waters are fouled and dirty, and there were very few dragonflies down there. Uh, I hope that is something that you might focus on. If you can get interest in these insects and get interest in this area, what a great cleanup and restoration project for MNS to get this back to what it was because you have these permanent deep ditches. They used to be covered with beautiful lily pads, many kinds of dragonflies buzzing around right in front of you. That could happen again, I'm sure, but it would take some commitment. Right now, it's a mess, I'm sorry to say. Which is why I'm not showing you MJC dragonflies. I'm going to take you straight to Samajaya, which, as I say, is a great place to take your grandchildren uh, over there somewhere. <laughs> and uh, also a good place to look at dragonflies with their insects. You can see there's a nice little pond here. We'll spend a lot of time looking at that tomorrow. So what can we see? So I want to give you a little portfolio. These are also the one, mostly the ones you're going to see on the little handout sheet of some of the things that you might see in Samajaya or elsewhere in the Kuching area. So let's just have a little port dragonfly portfolio. We've met, I, and again, I, I put the English names in brackets because I think the scientific names are more important, but I put them there for, well, to avoid driving you crazy, I suppose. Uh, Seriagrion serena rubella, the ornate Coral tail, a damselfly, again, one that eats all the other damselflies, so the likeliest one you'll see. You may see, if you caref look carefully, the variable feather legs, Copra vitata. Remember, I said the damselfly legs often are feathery, so they can catch small insects with them. Also, this one, you'll notice the legs are bright yellow, and that, it, that's a mark that it uses to signal and uh, fight off rival males. 
Brachydiplex calibia. This is one of the commonest dragonflies we have, the blue dasher. And there are several blue dragonflies. This has got that blue powdery pruinosity on it you see here. This one has these orange brick sides. That's the key to identifying it. Another dragonfly that you can find right with it at Samajaya is this one, the pond adjunct, the Aethrea mantagracilis, which you notice the sides are here. It's also small. <laughs> what? Did I just lose the mic? Another. I'm going to start to see Okay. Hello? Hello? All right, back to talk. Okay. As I say, this one, just to go back and have a look. Orange sides, blue sides. And this is a little smaller, so you can probably see both of these smaller. Yeah, this is less smaller. You can see Rachagonia octolata, much brighter color than that picture shows you. Iridescent bluish and orange. Lives along the trail edge, not so much around the pond. Light shade. Very small. Even smaller, the world's smallest dragonfly. Manifia pygmaea, the scarlet pygmy, the male the female. This thing is only about that big. Very, very, very tiny. And you look for it in wet, grassy areas where the males sit in whole territories. It's easy to walk by it because it's so small. Now, the dragonfly wing, you see here that there's a clear area at the edge of the wing and it kind of curves around like this and it meets here at the beginning of this red parse, which whatever we call the stigma. That makes this the common parasol. It's also the smallest. This one looks obvious, but it's bigger. The red comes out a little bit further on the sign of it. It's this neurothemus from Ramburii. Ramburi was a 19th century sign of This is one where it's kind of hard to tell. The bigger it's probably this, and smaller it's probably the other one. And there are some wing vein features that help. Then there's this one, Terminata, you see the top, which it's a nice straight edge. It doesn't curve back. Take a look at this one. And this one. And you see that in this one, in the clear area, is a nice sweeping arc in the back of the wing. This one is cut off straight. This is the straight edge now. But knowing the genus, this is an easy genus for it. The species are a And just here's a little chart just to show you the differences, which I stole from the internet and you can do it too. But again, it shows you that the wings of females vary. These are the three species. This one is smaller, this is bigger, this is also bigger. Plus, you know, these two are bigger, this one is bigger. If you want to look up the wall, you should be seeing them with the site of the steel distinction. The one that we've been looking at in the background all along, or the Venus Pro the variable set, called variable because most of them are orange, but there are some of them that are dark blue. I've never seen a dark blue in here, I've seen one of one of the many red dragonflies. This is Orthetum testacium, the scarlet skimmer. The key here is to look at, first of all, brown eyes, brown patch of face and wings, red thorax and abdomen. Here's its cousin, a very common dragonfly, the spine tufted skimmer, Orthetum crisis. Brown eyes again, but a brown thorax, only the abdomen is red. This is a very common dragonfly in some of and they all have that complete vein across here and here that I modeled in the earlier. Orthectrum dragonflies also come in blue. This is the blue skinner or orthectrum walker, a nice waxy blue coated all over. If you see a big blue, blue dragonfly, it's probably this one, as opposed to the small ones I showed you earlier. This is also a very, very common dragonfly, which you'll see at Samajaya almost everywhere. The slender skimmer. This is a dragonfly that's found all the way from the Mediterranean to Australia. It's a huge range. Basically green and black in stripes and colors. It's everywhere. There are a few dragonflies that do look something like it, but they're much less common. This one, which you see at Chipotle a lot, the male is blue, but the female looks kind of like a smaller version of this. But the shape, this one has a very, very swollen base of the abdomen. The 
other one, I'll show you how rough this is. This is a terrible picture. This was a, drag, a pair of dragonflies I saw at MJC Forest. Said, oh, it's just our vet from Salina again. Well, they're in the yellow picture. Snapped off one lousy shot. Got it home, looked at the computer, saw this iridescent dark here and its heavy belly. Oh my god, this is a much, much rarer dragonfly, a pot belly elf, that I've never seen one. I've been back to the over and over and over again. So that's why I say carry a camera and look closely. This one, another red dragonfly with brown thorax and brown eyes, the saddleback glider. This one, probably the easiest way to tell you to look at this is it doesn't land. This is the only one I've ever seen land. This was at Lambert Hills last weekend. You see them at Salajaya, the kind of orangey, horsing back and forth over the pond. The other red dragonflies will all land over and over again. This one just stays flying around and never lets you go. It's a member of a group of dragonflies called saddlebags. They have these big dark patches of face and green. So you think of an old cowboy riding on a horse with saddlebags on either side of the side. Beautiful common scarlet with a nice black stripe along the top of the abdomen. That's the male. The female should be wearing. This is another of the common red dragonflies. This one is this one you can see the whole thing's red. Even the eyes are red. There's red along the wings that you can hardly see. No black stripes of any kind. This is the red boat. Rotifus rupa. Which basically means the red dragonfly that's red. <laughs> Another beautiful genus of dragonflies is Ryopinus, the flutterers. The flutterers come east, they all have very strongly patterned wings, but the wings differ wildly from one to the next. Look at this one. This is the bronze flutterer. This is the yellow barred flutterer, probably one you'll see quite commonly. You see this with this black and yellow patch, it looks like it's trying to be a butterfly. Here's the sapphire flutterer, beautiful iridescent blue. Lovely, lovely insects. And then even prettier in a way are two dragonflies that I've both seen at Samajaya that like the forest. You'll find them along the forest trail, see them by the legal Indian and off the ground. This is the grenadier, which I've only seen once or twice there. It's naked. And this is the handsome grenadier. It's the male and the female. It's a gorgeous insect. And this one, uh, the last few times I've been to Samajaya, I found them on the trail again, sitting right next to the trail, on a little bare edge with this high, and they're very tame. As a matter of fact, the last time I was there, I found one with a group of photographers having a photography class around it, and the instructor had a spray bottle of water. And he was spraying the dragonfly with water so that there were little nice droplets on there to show up the photographs, and the dragonfly just sat there. <laughs> <laughs> So I hope it's there. It's not there all the time, but it's been the last, last couple of times I've been there. And if you want to go to Samajaya, right in Hasu, and look in the canals, you may see this. This is one of our night flying dragonflies. Remember I told you the female that we brought us in the corner of our apartment three nights? This is the male. Sorry, very difficult to get used to job this They look like ghosts. Pale white body, black wings, the dust walker. So, as I've said, there's a lot yet to learn about dragonflies and damselflies in Borneo. Uh, this one, for example, isn't in the book. This is the coastal glider, not the diplomatic sephora. It likes to live along sandy beaches. I, I photographed this one at Dama, who's sitting on a piece of driftwood right on the sandy beach. The male is red, so the female has these black marks along the avenue. In the book of Borneo Dragonflies, the folks says, why is this thing never turned up in Borneo? And the answer is, well, as you need to know. <laughs> so that's a recent discovery. First time I saw one, I said, well, have I just made this wonderful new discovery? And I wrote it off to some people and said, no, no, it's there, it's just not there. <laughs> but there are still dragonflies that are not named yet. New species waiting to be discovered, even very close to us. If there are really about 300 species of Borneo, you probably right. At least 40 of them, 40 percent, are found nowhere else in the world but here. They're as special to Borneo as our special birds are, our picture plants, our orchids. They're part of the heritage of the natural history of Borneo that we 
we share with no one else in the world that we need to protect and take care of every bit as much as some of the things that we've been focusing our attention even more. And that's probably the main reason that we do this talk is to say, here's a beautiful, fascinating, fun group of animals that you can see here that you can help conserve as well as enjoy watching. So, let's go over that. I want to mention one thing. Just before I gave this talk, just to show you how people do think about dragonflies, a gentleman in the audience came up to me and said, I saw the ad for the talk. I wanted to show you something. I want to give you something. And he gave me this. This is a picture of Eurotimus Lamoria. I know that. He took 30 years ago and keep it on the shelf. My granddaughter had it, and he wanted me to have it just to show me how interested he was in the subject. So there's a precedent for being interested in dragonflies here. Thank you very, very much. And let's do this. Um, 
Where is the best time you can see more of the Dragon file or the Dragon file? Uh, I find that, for instance, I used to go down to the NJC road and I found that if I got there much before 10 o'clock, not much was due, but from 10 on, uh, it's usually, it has to be a sunny day is much better than a cloudy day. And uh, they do need to bask, they do need to get enough energy from the sun to be able to fly properly. Bearing in mind that there are some damsel flies and dragon flies that are only active at dawn and dusk, some of them even come out after dark, particularly in forested areas. So, um, but for most of the species, I would say, so when the birds stop singing and you're wondering what to do with the rest of your day, that's a good time to start dragon flying. What eats dragon flies and Oh, plenty of things. Uh, I, I, have a, I have a photograph I took in the United States of a dragonfly being eaten by a large lizard. Uh, some birds will eat them, of course. Uh, the lizards, if they can catch them, frogs, uh, probably some fishes, if they can catch them. Um, other dragonflies, as we said. So, uh, yeah, I'm quite fair to know if they're not turtle ones, maybe not to get them right. What do they actually do? In other insects, though, uh, except that, as I saw, the, the nymphs can also catch tadpoles, small fish, uh, depending on which species, not their big enough, you know, good beans, uh, frogs. Uh, but normally speaking, it's other flying insects. Right? Uh, Is it the nymphs?